Yeah, thank you, Chris. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I like going through this presentation uh, for a number of reasons, and I'll, I'll touch on those as I, as I move through this. So uh, successful teams, I have successful in quotation marks. So let me just get going, and there's a reason for that. Anyway, so I've been coaching for a long time, and I'll go through a little bit of my background here right away because that's important. Uh, and Chris and I do go a long way back. Uh, I've known Chris for many, many years uh, in his university coaching days and uh, at both uh, Queens and Windsor and so on. And we played against each other. We went to school a bit together too. So long history. Anyway, so successful teams. Uh, I've coached at many different levels. And uh, as I've gone through uh, over the years, uh, the question that I started to really come back to all the time is, you know, why were the teams that I had success with successful? And what values were consistent across those teams at different levels that caused that success? Um, let's get rid of that. What's going on behind the X's and O's? And these are all questions that popped up in my mind as I really started to think a lot about why uh, I've had the success or the teams that I've coached have had the success that we've had. And ultimately I decided to take a deep dive and really think about what was going on behind the scenes. So I pop up this picture is my first coaching uh, gig back at my home school, University of Saskatchewan. And uh, those of you in Canada, uh, Lisa Tomitis, the women's national team coach, she's had a lot of success uh, anyways, we were hired at the same time. So it's one of my claims to fame. Anyway. So I got to touch a little bit on my background just so that you have an understanding of, of where I'm coming from and some of the things that I'll hit on here. And I do have to keep track of time because I can venture off into a lot of stories and so on, which uh, I want to make sure I get through everything that I need to get through. Anyway, so I've coached provincial teams here in Saskatchewan in Canada, uh, U Sport, uh, University of Victoria assistant coach, uh, Cape Breton University was my first job, University of Saskatchewan. Uh, I was assistant coach with a team that represented Canada and the Jones Cup in Taiwan. Professionally, uh, I was an assistant coach. There's been a few leagues that have come through uh, Canada here, NBL. National Basketball League years ago. Uh, and then most recently, this past summer, I was head coach and GM of the Sask Rattlers. Uh, and I have kids, three of them. And I've spent extensive time uh, coaching minor sports as well. I took a bit of a different route. University sport, national team, professional, and then uh, almost reverted back and did a lot of minor sport coaching too. Uh, as I moved through my years, uh, a lot of success, AUS, we won a championship in my early years. Uh, University of Saskatchewan, uh, we were able to win a national championship, Canada West, a national championship. Uh, so we had a lot of success at the U Sport level. And then after my youth sport, believe it or not, after I spent a lot of time minor sport because my kids were heavily involved in sport. And uh, a lot of the things I learned and, and came across in my youth sport days, uh, uh, I applied, and I'm going to talk about some of those lessons that I learned, even at the younger age in terms of uh, really thinking about what success was, reflecting and, and learning. And I learned a lot after coaching at high levels and going back and coaching at the minor sport level, uh, hockey, some soccer and lots of basketball. So it's been an interesting journey. Uh, and then last summer, uh, like I said, I was fortunate enough to get an opportunity to uh, coach in the CEBL, which is about to kick off here again. They, they're going to do a summer series similar, I think, to the NBA in Canada here. They're, they're going to run a 10-day uh, league, but I stepped away just because of family commitments, so on. But I coached last summer, and we were able to uh, pull a team together uh, and win an, win a uh, championship in the first year. Uh, uh, if you see some names pop up, he's done over the years. have so also influenced me as I've watched him grow and develop and, and uh, apply a lot of his ideas. 
So let's get to the, the meat of what I want to talk about. So over those years, lots of reflecting, lots of learning and growing. And I just wanted to make this general statement. Uh, I like doing these presentations and talking to coaches. Uh, and I think all of us need to think about this as we move when you're talking to your team, you're talking to other coaches, or you're sharing your own ideas. I find I'm not really trying to, when you go through this process, not really trying to convince other people of anything when I'm sharing. Uh, I think as I go through this, I'm more interested in continuing to try and figure things out for myself. And maybe through my, my talk about my experience and some of the lessons I've learned and making some of the connections of what leads to be you to be a successful coach, uh, I may be able to help you somewhere along the way in your coaching journey, because as you all know, coaching is a very personalized, there's some consistencies across uh, all levels and all teams and all sports, but ultimately uh, you have to put your own personal touch on it. Anyway, skip back to some of the questions when I was really digging in and taking that deep dive. Why did we not get the success we wanted when uh, on certain teams? And why were we successful? What were the differences? And I started to notice that when we weren't successful, a lot of the values we were focused on or reasons that we looked to when we weren't successful were all basketball values. You know, we, we, uh, we weren't defending properly. Our offense wasn't great. We couldn't shoot. We didn't execute well. Bad decisions, not focused, rebounding, turnovers. Our focus was all on basketball values uh, as to reasons why we weren't successful. And then when I asked the question, okay, well, what was the key things about the teams that we did when we were, when we were successful? And I found uh, as I was thinking about that and, and reflecting, uh, all of the reasons weren't basketball values, they were life values. Well, we were a really together group our effort. We were fearless. We were highly motivated. We were extremely tough. We were resilient. Our energy was good. We were focused on the task at hand. And notice, uh, yeah, there would always be a little bit of basketball, obviously, in there is the uh, reasons why we're successful and, and one at the highest levels. But ultimately, the main reasons were life values and not basketball values which I found very interesting and it got me, you know, really thinking uh, a little bit more about success. And then, uh, uh, sorry, it's a little bit blurry here, but Mike McKay, Basketball Canada, works with the women's national team. I've seen a few of his presentations. He spends a lot of time talking about this taxonomy of knowledge and how you build into uh, the creative realm here, which is ultimately where I found our best teams and our most successful teams were. They were individuals and they're very creative, very confident. Uh, we were a very together group. And this interested me. And then I went back and really thought about successful teams that I had. And I started thinking about what were the most important things. Well, we had a plan. We knew exactly what we were going to do on both sides of the ball and, and what was going on. We really knew or really worked to create a positive environment. So we knew how the, mo the important environmental cues and the things that we wanted going on in practice and in the room and interactions. We knew what kind of environment that we needed and we had a really strong, solid environment and everybody understood how we were going to do what we were trying to do. Our relationships were very strong on our most successful teams. We knew who we were. Each of us knew who we were. Highly motivated. We knew why we were there. It was very important. Everybody was highly motivated right from uh, coaching staff through every single player in the team was highly motivated. All the players and coaches very mindful. We were self-directed. We, we held each other accountable. We were creative, very confident, and very aggressive, particularly in the big moments. And as I thought through this, again, just to go back to what I said earlier, uh, basketball value is very important, don't get me wrong. And I could talk on and on about, you know, uh, uh, ball screens and, and spacing and movement and different things that we did. But ultimately, 
those were important, but we found as we work through, and there's not a lot of discussion here about, about uh, the X's and O's in the basketball values, the life values were the most important things that led to us being successful. And with that in mind, hopefully this doesn't over, I'm going to break this down. With that in mind, I went back to that Bloom's taxonomy and I said, I tried to take uh, a number of the things that, that I just talked about and, and kind of fit them into coaching success. And I, I deem this the coaching success mountain. And you can see I got the what, which is the basketball, the plan, and everyone needs to understand. And then you create the environment and this comfort zone. I'll talk about this in a bit, uh, but how you're going to achieve your plan. These are mostly transactional and this is kind of where the basketball values live. So you have to build that as your foundation. Everybody has to know what you're trying to do and what the plan is. Everybody, you have to create a solid environment to carry out your plan. And you notice the mountain gets a little steeper here and it, it becomes a little bit more difficult uh, to climb this portion of the mountain. You really have to work at it. And this is where the, the life values really kick in. It becomes more transform transformational, or you become more transformational. If you're transactional, you're giving information, players are accepting it, and they're understanding what you're given, and it, it's kind of a one-way stream. Transformational means you begin to start to change people. You really get to know them. You get inside them about how they really tick. You get to know the individual. You really develop a strong relationship. Climb up a little further. You really start to know and really dig in deep about why they're there, and you really make that deep connection, which ultimately allows you to hold each other accountable and create those mindful players that really understand the process and ultimately self-directed is, is where you want to get to. And when you build this mountain, success happens. Well, let's break this mountain down a little bit. You, as a coach, you have to really have a strong foundation. And this plan will evolve over the years. And, and this is not the be-all, end-all, but I'm just giving you an idea of, of some of the things uh, that I found over the years in terms of it's important to have a vision of what you want your team to look like. And a vision, in my mind, is if you had a team picture up on the wall, what would you want written as descriptors of that team? And these are just some examples. Uh, fit, strong, resilient, unified, hardworking, and tough, technically and tactically skilled. So that's what you're striving for. Uh, and again, this is, uh, you have to come up with this yourself, but this just gives you some ideas and example. Mission is how are you going to achieve your vision? And uh, I've got in here using Basketball Canada's long-term athlete development model. They, they've done a lot of work, particularly uh, to uh, identify and to, so you can explore that on your own. Uh, recruit and train the best athletes possible and professional development two to three times a week as needed. So I'm, I'm writing this for myself as a coach, the things I need to focus on to create the vision that I'm striving for. And then the environment that you're working under, you have to have to ground yourself in some pretty strong values. And I've always used the word pride as a uh, neat little acronym. Uh, purposeful, so things we do, you're efficient, you're focused, respectful. I'm gonna speed through these a little bit so I can get to some of the other points because there's a lot of information here. Uh, always grateful to all, uh, supportive, positive, challenging, to be an inspirational, determined, excellent, innovative, and performance-driven. And then uh, the foundations of physically what you want to accomplish. And then you have to think about your style of play and the things that are important to you on both sides of the wall. So physically, what kind of standards and testing, depending on what situation you're in, what, you know, what's the baseline. Uh, providing your kids, uh, depending on your situation, with the ability to access training uh, year-round, and that may be just in season. You only have them. Might that might be your year if you have contact with them uh, 
other times of the year, or you build in other sports if you're at the high school level and kids are doing other things. A recovery and regeneration, nutrition, hydration, sleep and rest. And depending on how much access you have to sport med, you may have to do some of this research on your own uh, and provide it to your kids just to make sure that they physically understand uh, what it means to play at whatever level that you're coaching at and the importance of all those things. And then on the basketball side of the things, have a and again, these are, these are mine over the years. Uh, and you certainly may have different pillars, but the teams I've coached ran, they were running teams. So that, that uh, with respect to your style of play and, and physical, you have to be physically be able to execute the things that you want to do, but running teams, movement and spacing was a key pillar. Playing through the key, uh, I found over the years that uh, if we shot a higher field goal percentage, regardless of the three-point line or not, and we got to the free throw line more than our opponents, uh, we would win, win virtually all of those games. So a lot of our emphasis in, in terms of things that we're running and, and ball movement and where we're putting people is trying to, to create that higher field goal percentage and create free throw opportunities, winning the rebound percentage battle and things you can do there and take care of the ball. Uh, Transition D, very important, disruptive 94 feet, protect the paint, toughness, and uh, no bad fouls. Uh, and like I said, this, I'm talking more uh, not X's and O's and on the court stuff. I could do presentation on this for a couple hours, but I'll move past it. But it's important for you as a coach to lay this foundation and understand if you have that team picture on the wall, what do you want written under that? How are you going to accomplish that vision? What kind of values are you going to operate within? What are the physical standards or, or things that you're capable of in your program? And really think about how you want to play the game. And uh, take, take your time on that. And it'll, it may evolve over time. And, and you, you have to think about it deeply so that you can become well-versed and confident uh, as you're teaching it to your team. So have a plan. Make sure you're, everyone in your program understands it. That's the what piece. You really have to make sure, and you know, this is a big wide base. If you don't have a good strong base here and you don't have a good solid plan, uh, you're going to have trouble building up on this mountain. Then you need to create that environment that's going to allow you to uh, work that plan. social and emotional. So I found over the years a certain buzz or mantra that we've uh, kind of settled in or I've settled it on that I think is very powerful in terms of communicating with athletes and really setting some high standards that create that environment that allow you to carry out your plan. Heavy, heavy focus on team first attitude. Heavy, heavy focus on we don't accept anything your best effort and a really strong focus on perseverance and what that means is when things aren't going your way when you're not having a good day in practice or you get a bad call against you in a game or you're not playing as much as you want and things just aren't going your way make sure that you do the first two the team always comes first and hard work is always there and i've created some pillars or buzzwords that we've used over and to create the environment, you have to be consistent, set the bar high and have the word practice stop or words practice stoppers here. And that means in general, things have to stop and you have to have to make sure that people are understanding the environment that we're working in and we can't accept anything less than what we've all agreed to and support it. So teamwork, be connected, be supportive, be encouraging, be there, be helpful. At the beginning, it may be contrived. And I think as a coach, when you're first getting your team, you might have to contrive some things. So one of the things I found uh, work to really kind of contrive, and then it becomes organic. Stand up, huddle up, pick them up. Somebody's coming off the floor after substitution, everybody stands up, gives them five. On the court, when you have opportunities, uh, free throws in the FIBA system, you can huddle up. Uh, anytime you have an opportunity just to come together, the five players on the court huddle up and pick them up. And this one is physical or emotional. 
if somebody falls on the court, we should see four other players running over there picking them up. If somebody's emotionally down, we should see all other teammates run into their rescue uh, figuratively and supporting them and encouraging them. And you may have to contrive a few things like that and come up with some neat little things at the beginning, but ultimately you want to get to where it becomes organic and where teamwork is extolled and everyone uh, puts the team before themselves. Uh, neat little story. I don't want to tell too many stories or I'll never get to the end of this, but uh, one of the most inspirational team first attitudes, uh, we we're playing uh, in our conference semifinal uh, out at the University of British Columbia. Uh, we were playing uh, against at that time, I think they were ranked number one or two, probably number two in the country and they were number one in our conference and we we're playing them in the semifinal. Uh, we had about uh, 10 or 20 fans out of about 2,500. And that was just our parents uh, for our team. Crowd's going crazy, game back and forth, uh, comes right down to the end of the game. And uh, we have the ball, we feed a guy under the basket and he gets fouled with no time on the clock and the game is tied. Referees clear the floor, players go to their benches and this poor guy, uh, his name was Nolan. Uh, had to go to the free throw line. There was him and the referee and 2,500 fans who were doing everything possible to get, get him to miss. All he had to do was make one free throw. We're on to the Canada West final and get to the Canada West final. Two teams would go on to the national championship. And this was the year we won the national championship. So our season was tie game right at the end of the game. We lose that game. Our season's probably over. Uh, but if we win that game, we go on to the national championships. Anyways, he steps up to the line, shoots his first free throw, misses, and now the crowd gets really excited. He steps up to the line uh, for a second shot, uh, misses his second shot, and the place is going crazy. And poor Nolan out there on his own. Uh, I physically had to go out onto the court and help him back to the bench. And uh, as I was getting ready to speak, and this is one of those organic team first moments, before I could even open my mouth, uh, every single player uh, in that huddle stepped up and in their own way said, we have to win this game, not for ourselves. We have to win this game for Nolan so that he doesn't have to carry this memory forward that he had a chance to send us on to uh, Canada's final and the national championships. And uh, I didn't have to say anything. I stepped back. And in that overtime, five-minute overtime, I think we scored 24 points. And the other team scored two, believe it or not, in a five-minute overtime. So it was remarkable. And that was just a moment where every single player on the team knew that everybody else was there for them. And it's just one of those organic moments that uh, is kind of neat to see. Uh, hard work, extremely important. Extol effort. Anytime there's effort, you have to absolutely have a party and uh, encourage teammates to understand the importance of effort. Set the bar high. That's where you practice. Don't accept a secondate effort out of anyone. And as you get to know your players, you know what their best effort is. Video is always good to use uh, and showing effort plays. Uh, it might be individually creating little highlight videos of players who are working hard, but really emphasizing the importance of effort, encouragement, always try your best. Now these seem like just cliches in some respects, but you have to talk to your team about it constantly. And if you're talking about it, they start to understand it's important. And then you get to the stage where players are talking to each other about it. And then you know something really needs starting to happen. Uh, create that never give up attitude, resilient role model. Talk to your players constantly about this stuff, courageous. And like I said, when things aren't going your way, be a great teammate and work hard, period. Not as long as I'm playing, as long as I'm getting my shots, as long as I'm feeling good. There should be no as long as. It's I'm going to be a great teammate. I'm going to work hard, period, no matter what's going on. And you have to talk about these things. And when you have that environment, you'll find uh, you really start to carry out that plan that you set. Now, you'll notice fairly easy climb here having a plan, making sure everybody understands it, creating that environment. I've got a thicker line here. You'll be a pretty good team if you live down here. 
you have a good program, things will run pretty well. Uh, things will, you know, you'll, and most teams live in this area. Most programs live in this area. If you want to really start to climb up and create something neat, you have to start to think about becoming a little bit more transformational, really start to focus on those life values. And the only way you start to be able to do that is you really have to dig into who your players are. And it's not that difficult of a process, but you have to develop that relationship. And I found over the years, be honest, absolute, absolute brutal honesty. And when you're honest with players and anybody working with you, it always leads to increased trust and ultimately that relationship you're going for. If there's not honest communication, you're not going to gain that trust of your players and that relationship, that deep relationship that you need to have if you're going to climb up that success mountain is not going to be there. Uh, a couple of things that you can do regular check in with your players, not just about b-ball. Uh, and you have to, I've got the words caring, support, and integrity. Show them that you care about them more than just as a basketball player. Support them in basketball, but also in other things in their life. And that continued integrity. If you say you're going to do something for your player, make sure you do it. Always, always, always follow through. And there's even with young kids, I talk to young kids, very important at the youth sport level. And I underline pros here because I had my first experience last summer. And one of the things that kind of – stuck out to me and I thought when the team really came together is is a lot of these players at the pro level are are used to be being treated as commodities and uh, not people and my approach was I talked you know I, it was just the way I operated we talked to them lots you know before practice after practice checking in with them what's going on with your family oh I didn't know you had brothers you know things like that and when there was opportunities for me to support them in some way outside of basketball and help them out with something I did. Uh, and when I said I'd do something, I'd carry through on it. It wasn't that I was trying to do anything special. It was just kind of how I always operated. And a lot of feedback from several of the players on how much they appreciated somebody speaking to them as a person and caring for them and supporting them and not simply just treating them as a basketball player. And uh, when they started to trust me uh, last summer, and I don't know if any of you followed that CBL, but we, really, we got really good as, as the season rolled on and there were some ups and downs, but uh, that trust really led to a positive relationship and, and it just keeps growing from there. A couple other things, again, just tying to what I've said before, you got to absolutely speak the truth to your, to your players. And I've got underlined young coach there. My very first year was out at, at the Atlantic in the Atlantic Conference out at Cape Breton on the east coast of Canada. And my first head coaching job after being assistant for many years, I came into a team who had, uh, you know, some pretty strong, strong minded veterans. And we had one guy in particular who was in his uh, fifth year. We played five years in Canada and he, it was his team. And I came in as a young coach and I think I was 28 years old and he was, uh, you know, I was only three or four years older than him. I think it was four years older, four or five years older. Sorry. Anyways, it was his team and he was, uh, you know, trying to run things and, you know, and I'm scared is not the right word, but I'm trying to fit in and I'm a first year coach and I'm not really confident a hundred percent in the things that I, I wanted to do and, and still trying to find my way in the world. Anyways, Team started off slow, and, and he was very gregarious, and he'd get in trouble with the referees. And anyways, there are all kinds of things going on. And, and I finally, uh, rightly or wrongly, an emotional moment in the team room after a loss, I uh, decided, uh, and I don't know, I wasn't pre-planned, but I decided to go on a massive rant and call him out for all the things that I thought were inappropriate and that he wasn't doing, that he needed to do as a leader, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that was a turning point in our season. We went on, lost in the national championship semifinal, but we won the conference and so on. I think we won like 10 or 12 games in a row. Uh, and after, it was a huge moment, after I went after him and spoke the truth to him, uh, he didn't thank me directly in front of the team in that moment, but shortly after that, he pulled me aside uh, literally that same day and and thanked me for my honesty and 
uh, brutal honesty and and we developed trust immediately and the relationship grew from there. Uh, don't lie for short-term feelings. Uh, play in time and roll on the team. Sometimes as a coach, we're trying to make all our players like us, particularly when you're a young coach. And in the long run, it never works out. Play the long game. You never get away with it. And uh, like I said, I put the word pro here again, and I noticed that a lot. Uh, I tried to be brutally honest with the pro guys on you know where I seen them fitting in and and what they needed to do on the team. And, and there was a lot of appreciation for the honesty, way more. Even if it hurt people's feelings in the short run, in the long run, people have always come back to me and say, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for telling me exactly what you thought uh, instead of worried about my short-term feelings. You're, you're playing the long game here. Uh, honesty about the role on the team. Players respect honesty and they'll chew you up if you pander. And you have to avoid that because in the moment, uh, you, it's hard to hurt pre people's feelings, but uh, honesty is always the right way, to, right way to go. Always, always, I've found over the years. So when you get that relationship built through some honest communication, build that trust, you really start to know who the players now are now. Now you get up into the motivational piece, which ultimately is really going to help you uh, create that championship environment that you want how am i doing for time here okay good understanding player player and this is where the connection really gets deep and you really have to think about this uh as you get to know the player and you built that trust in that relationship you can really start to find out what is meaningful to them and what they want to really achieve everybody will say i want to win and you know, these kinds of things. But if you get beneath that, you really find out why they're there. Why are they on your team? What do they want to accomplish? What's important to them? And you show you understand by your actions. And ultimately, I put these words in big bold here. Ultimately, when we do anything, we as coaches, we as people, anything in your life, and basketball is no different, you go into any situation because you want to enjoy what you're doing and you want to get better at it. And that's the underlying motivation of everybody as a person. When you engage in anything that's meaningful to you, you want to enjoy it and you want to get better at it. And it's important to understand. And that's been a consistent, uh, deep underlying motivator. And when you pull these words apart, enjoyment is not fun. Uh, fun is different than enjoyment, but enjoyment only occurs when what you're doing is meaningful to you and meaning comes from responsibility. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And development or improvement only occurs when someone is uncomfortable. So once you understand as a coach and you talk to your player and you really understand why they're there and what is meaningful to them and you give them some responsibility, to be able to develop, and this is a great finger or thumb you can put on players, you have to hold them accountable. And if they're not doing or taking care of their responsibilities because you know it's meaningful, you got to remind them of it. You got to hold them to account. Um, good exa a couple of good examples, I guess, of that uh, without talking too much. And then I pull together this equation. I'll talk about the specific examples, but you, you are talking to players and get them to understand that we're all here because we want to enjoy our experience and we want to get better. And the only way to enjoy what you're doing and improve at what you're doing is you have to absolutely put the team first. You've got to work your tail off and you have to persevere when things are not going your way. If you don't do those three things, you'll never enjoy fully what you're doing and you'll never develop as much as you want to develop. So you have to get strong buy into that. But example, so we have a point guard on the national championship university team. And he was a, a younger guy and he was playing behind two senior point guards who were both all-star level guys. And ultimately, I played them both at the same time with Sharon Glover and Mike Linklater. And Preston O'Brien was the guy sitting behind him, a guy from uh, uh, Regina, another city here in Saskatchewan. 
he was a pretty good player. But when I talked to him, because as you all know, you need everybody on your team engaged. When I talked to Preston, what was really meaningful to him was being part of the team and he wanted to contribute in some way. And he had an understanding that, you know, there's two senior all-star level point guards. He's probably not going to play a whole lot. But he, what was meaningful to him was not necessarily playing a whole lot, but he had to be a contributor to the team. So when I thought about that and we talked about it, uh, I talked to him about giving him the responsibility of how important it was every day in practice to put on his work boots and go out there and challenge the two point guards in front of him in every competitive situation. Because ultimately that contribution to the team would make the team better and the players better that he was playing against and ultimately really help him improve as a player. So his responsibility was to come out and try to kick their ass every day. And he was pretty good, and some days he would have good moments, but he would never back down. He would never take a, take a step back. He would, in practice, that was his championship moments, would be to come out, and I gave him that responsibility. And, I, when, and he agreed to it, and, and when he found that he was having an effect or he was contributing to the performance of the team by how hard he was going in practice and how hard he was challenging these guys in every single drill and every single situation, excuse me, situation. He could see that his contribution to the team and why what was meaningful to him was, was, was occurring. And I would hold him accountable daily on, you know, get after it get after these guys and put them in situations where he's going to compete with them. And it became a very positive situation. And he's come back to me years after, even though he didn't, he played hardly at all that season and on a, on another team, a lesser team, he probably would have played more, but he was thankful for his opportunity and it's affected him in life as he's moved forward into the work world about how important it is to uh, find meaning in what you're doing and take responsibility, even if it's not this quote unquote star role. Uh, and just another short story because I got other stuff. And then if you look at those two uh, high level point guards, we had two of them and had to find a way to, to keep both those guys happy. They were both uh, ball dominant uh, alpha dogs. And we had a lot of struggles early in the year. But as I talked to them both, they both wanted the same thing. They both wanted to, to be it part of the decision-making process on the court and they wanted to be involved in strategy. They wanted to be uh, able to affect the decisions that were happening uh, during the game and in preparation for whoever we were playing against. So I, I sat them both down and we talked about and realized they both wanted the same thing. And one of the responsibilities that gave uh, led me to attach the meaning to them in terms of how they wanted to affect the team was we always wanted to pressure 94 feet and we'd often identify the other team's best point guard and say, we wanted pressure uh, on their point guard for the entire game. And, and oftentimes I was playing those guys together. Uh, and I told them, you guys decide based on your energy level and how you're feeling in the moment, who's going to pick up the ball. And maybe you're doing it for five minutes and you guys make the decision when you're going to switch off and who's going to pick up the ball. And then uh, we also got to the point of, okay, well, you guys, depending on how the game's flowing and, and, and if you're tired or how you're feeling, who's bringing up the ball or who's, who's pointing our offense in any particular moment. I gave that decision over to them. That's hard to do as a coach, but that's one of the great lessons I learned in terms of motivation, give out responsibility. Once you find out what's meaningful to the players, you have to, as a coach, uh, give them the responsibility so that that meaning, you're able to accomplish that meaning in why they're there. And when you attach those two things, uh, boy, you get some pretty motivated guys and that carries on throughout the team. It's pretty neat to see. And you hold them accountable once you agree on the responsibility as a coach it's your job to remind them constantly about this is what we agreed to this is what you're doing this is what you need to and and if it's meaningful to them they'll thank you
for challenging them. So we got a plan, environment, build those relationships, dig into that motivation, make that strong connection, understand why your players are there. And every one of them will be a little bit different in terms of why they're on your team and what's meaningful to them. And then identify some responsibility uh, that you can give them that will enhance or focus on the meaning of why they're there. And uh, when you make that connection, uh, these are lifelong connections then because you really get to know your players, but ultimately it helps you in those moments. And that leads to creating those mindful players. Players are part of the process. They become self-directed in all our best teams. Players, I was there guiding them uh, and holding them accountable or reminding them of the things that we talked about, but ultimately they were in charge of the team. It was their team with me as a supportive conductor. And it's hard to get there as a coach and your journey up the mountain to this stage is gonna be different for each of us because you have to tie your personality close to how you develop relationships for people with people and how you're going to uh, dig into making that strong connection with them and really understand why they're there. But those mindful, the mindfulness, as I've said, players understand the process and are engaged and are part of the process. And I'll, I'll come back to this equation that I've seen at all levels and understanding that players are there on your team and people get involved in things because they want to enjoy what they're doing and they want to get better at what they're doing. And you make the connection and when players understand the connection is that if I put the team first, if I always try my best and when things don't go my way and I make sure I put the team first and work hard that I will always enjoy my experience and I will get better. And ultimately that's why players are involved and people do things. And you can think of your own life when you get involved in things, why you're enjoy, involved in coaching. You want to enjoy what's going on. You want to get better at it. And enjoyment is team effort, perseverance. And again, we're not talking a, little, a lot about uh, basketball values here. So things that can encourage, support, help this mindfulness once you really understand your player and meet with the leaders on your team, could be senior guys, could be captains, so on. And I got the word pros here, and I already talked about the stories a little bit uh, about how thankful uh, some of those guys were, or all of them were, the fact that I talked to them a lot and, and got them involved in the process and, and uh, made, treated them not just as basketball commodities. And that's something I, I've just done over the years. but. The, the most successful teams is the leaders were involved. So another example of championship teams I started uh, in my later years in coaching at the university level is uh, meeting with uh, quote unquote, the seniors on senior leaders on the team could be, like I said, captains or senior players, but regularly we'd have a cycle Monday. We'd, we'd have an off day and, and maybe just a, a, a day where we recovery and we do some individual work, but I'd meet with the leaders on the team and we'd, look at who were playing on the Friday and Saturday that particular week. And I would ask them, okay, well, what should we do defensively? What are things that work offensively? And we'd sort of set our game plan together uh, with the team leaders. And we'd set the course for the week in terms of things that we wanted to focus on and what we wanted to work on. And when you include the player, players in the process and they understand, and when you walk into the team room, or you walk onto the court for practice, or you're getting into your game situation, it's not, the information isn't all coming from you as a coach about you know, or what strategy or that we have to, you know, how hard are we gonna work? What do we need to do here? You start to really notice that, and that's where the organic uh, player accountability really starts to expose itself, uh, where players start to hold each other accountable for being great teammates, for working hard, 
for persevering, for focusing on the important things. And then you as a coach turn your mind more to how are we going to be successful and win games as opposed to trying to motivate and put guys to, to put the team first, to work hard and to persevere. You know, all of those things start to be handled by the players. And it gets, you know, your teams get really, really, really good when the team grabs hold of the process and they're engaged and they under they feel that they are not it's not all coming from the coach not to really start to transform it and then like i said the responsibilities and you can do other things like uh warm ups game plan these are uh these are uh, responsibilities that you can give to players when we're talking about that motivational piece but you can allow the players to control uh, things and they really start to take control of the environment and the best teams we had like I said I never ever had to talk about putting the team first as we got into this you know into the season never ever in practice uh, to talk about you know hey we got to work a little bit harder here never had to talk about uh, you know never give up attitude or that perseverance when a bad call you know, guys would get off track, but before I had a chance to say anything, the teammates would be pulling them back in and say, hey, that's not how we roll here. We don't complain about officials. We don't, you know, we always work hard. Hey, team first around here. And and uh, when the players are involved and it becomes organic, it's really neat. Accountability comes from within. I've talked about that. So just this statement here. And again, it's a, it's a steep climb to get to this level and it doesn't happen overnight. But if you put those building blocks that we talked about in the mountain, you can get there and it gets really neat. Everyone pushes beyond where they are today. So we're constantly talking about everyone is, is less anxious about their weaknesses and become more courageous because they know everyone's there for them. And they know the process to, to get to enjoy your experience and develop is to put the team first, to work hard, and to persevere. So when you get in those tough, anxious moments, you understand it's just part of the process. And you become more courageous because you know you're on the right, right track. Back off and let them stumble as a coach. Face truth and obstacles, confront them. Everyone learns that when growth occurs, obstacles shrink. Again, these are words, it takes a long time to get there. But when you get there, it gets really, really, really neat, and your teams get really, really good. Not irregardless of talent, but when you have some talent mixed in with this kind of environment, uh, you really get uh, to that championship level. So, like I said, have a plan. Understand what you're doing. Hold players accountable. That's where that comfort zone comment comes in. Create that environment so everyone understands how we're operating. Get to know who your players are. That's where the truth leads to trust, leads to relationship. Dig a little deeper. Why are they there? What is important to them? What is meaningful to them on this team? And then give them some responsibilities that will support that meaning. That connection gets really strong then. Like I said, I have players coming back to me all the time talking about these things where at the time they didn't, but it's affected them in their life. Accountability starts to become organic when players are part of the process and they become self-directed. And that's where the transformation occurs. And these things carry on into their life. And you get really good. Composed, resilient, confident, aggressive, creative. And that's how you want to be in life. And ultimately, as a coach, uh, you'll feel really good about where you are when you get to that. So success in coaching, if I can put my finger on it. Uh, your athletes are mindful, gracious, because they understand the process, self-directed, confident, courageous, creative, composed, resilient, all words that are very difficult to accomplish, but I've given you a little bit of path towards it. And then most importantly, because this coaching gig is a tough, tough gig. And uh, one of, and you guys are on this call because you care so much. Caring so much is a strength, but it's also a weakness. Because as you know, any of you have been involved for a while, it can eat you up. I remember uh, bus trips back or uh, after losses uh, more than I remember the wins. And 
Uh, I remember not being able to sleep often coming home uh, and I'd be sitting up all night stewing about, you know, decisions I'd made and, and because I cared so much, but the reason I gained success as well is because I cared so much. So it's a strength and a weakness. Focus on the process, teamwork, hard work, plus never giving up equals enjoyment and success. So understand why your players are there. Everybody enters in, in my opinion, into any endeavor because they want to enjoy it and get better. Uh, but you have to pay your dues. You got to put others before yourself. You got to work your butt off. And when things get tough, don't ever give up. And uh, when you grab hold of that formula, you're going to feel pretty good. Uh, coaches, creating successful people, create good people, create an enjoyable environment to work within, putting values and, and ethics first, putting success in your control. You control putting the team first, creating that environment. You control holding the players' hard work, creating that never give up attitude and ultimately enjoyment develop. You have complete control of that. So it moves away from that wins and losses thing in terms of success and failure. But what I found when you focus on that process, uh, I've seen karma as I get older, you do the right things, you try to do the right things. you try to stay on the proper path. In the short run, you might have some ups and downs, but in the long run, I should have put quotation marks around winning, but because I see winning as this, but ultimately you win games. And uh, it feels really good when you're focused on the right things and you start to have a lot of success on the scoreboard. Uh, it gets really, really neat and enjoyable. So it took me a while to, so, and it, this is still an evolving kind of picture, but I'm kind of one of those guys that, that needs to kind of see everything together so that I can visually understand uh, and then kind of pull things apart. So again, I created this uh, mountain, not necessarily to convince anybody else of uh, the most important points of uh, successful coaching. I created it to try and understand for myself over the years why uh, some of it stumbled into success or created the success or the team started to get really good and win as I moved along. And I, I found uh, as I thought about it more and more that the plan creating the environment, developing those relationships, understanding the motivation of the players, getting up into this area, which was all part of, all completely in my control, ultimately led to some pretty damn good teams. And uh, applying some of this last summer with professionals, because I really had a chance to think about it after I stepped away from university coaching for a number of years, and uh, focused with the pro guys. Uh, obviously, we had a plan and, and the environment, but I really uh, spent a lot of time here. And the appreciative comments from these men who uh, wouldn't be us. These guys are pro players. They, there's no bullshit involved in terms of how they communicated to me. And if they didn't, something wasn't going right, I'd hear from their agent or them right away. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, so when they were uh, the positive feedback that they felt and uh, how enjoyable and how much they improved even in a, a short summer I thought was pretty neat and it just gave me further uh, fire that maybe I had something here that was uh, a little more meaningful than just to my own personal experience so I've had a chance to talk about this a couple of different times and and I uh, thankful to Chris for my opportunity here to talk about it again uh, because as I work through it myself personally, I've been able to uh, sort of refine some of my thoughts on some of this stuff even further. So it's uh, kind of a neat process. We're all involved in kind of a hugely dynamic personal journey here in coaching and everybody's path to enjoyment and development, which is what you should be focused on, enjoying what you're doing and getting better at it. And if you focus on those things, uh, and not necessarily did we win last year or did we lose, you're going to find that ultimately you'll end up in a good place in terms of um, what you're trying to accomplish, and it'll be more meaningful to you. So 
How am I doing on time? Oh, holy cow. That was perfect. Yeah, perfect. Uh, a few questions. Kane, you want to go? You want to yeah. ask a question? Hi, Coach. Hi. Just as a high school coach, I feel like part of building culture is getting the parents to buy in as well as the kids. And I'm just wondering if you have any advice for a high school coach to uh, get not only the parents, but the community in general behind your philosophy. Yeah, that's, that's great because uh, so uh, obviously through my university coaching, I had some contact with parents with very level and pro level none, but I have coached provincial teams, which is uh, quite a bit, which is high school level kids. And then even below that, uh, similarly, you have to be uh, in this area here, uh, the relationship piece. So I would always meet with the parents early in the season uh, if not right at the beginning, and, and tell them what your plan is. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. Here's our vision for our team, and it, you know, and that's the time to get some input. Here's our mission. Here's how we're going to accomplish it. Here's the values that we're working under. And you bring them in, into the umbrella and get them to understand that, uh, you know, in terms of how you want to run your team, because parents can have a massive effect on the environment on your team. And if you have uh, the dad who uh, thinks he's a basketball coach and sits in the stands and then the drive home uh, with their kid who uh, didn't play as much as he thought they should and tells them that they're better, their kid, you're better than the player that's playing in front of you, blah, blah, blah. It can destroy the environment on your team. So you have to get buy-in from the parents uh, as early as possible and you have to be honest and try to gain some trust so that a relationship is built so the parents will come to you before they'll uh, if I can use the word bitch about their playing their kids playing time to their kid who then will take that into the room or take it onto the bench or take it onto the court that's a great question because that that's that can blow up destroy your mountain if you have parents that are not involved in the process. So communication, honest communication, which hopefully a parent, you'll build some trust with parents and some will be harder than others, I'm sure you know. Uh, but communication is honest communication, early similar with the players and try to get that buy-in. And, and you, you, I wouldn't say it's 100% guarantee, but you're not getting anywhere unless you, you talk early and have that parent meeting. It may require some individual meetings with parents too. Uh, so that they understand um, what you're trying to accomplish and how you're trying to accomplish it. Hope that helps. Thank not you. E not easy with parents. <laughs>